Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about polar equations and functions. In the previous lesson, we introduced a new way to look at location in the plane, polar coordinates. Now, by now we've seen thousands of graphs, probably literally thousands of graphs, where x and y are in relationship with each other, right? As the horizontal changes, the vertical changes somehow. Either x and y are both in an equation and we graph the equation, we figure out all the solutions to that equation, we graph it, or y is a function of x and we graph the function, right? As x changes, how will y respond? We can do the exact same thing with polar coordinates. The variables r and theta can be put in some sort of relationship, and then we can graph the resulting polar coordinates. Before you watch this lesson, make sure you've watched the previous lesson before watching this one. You really, really need to understand polar coordinates on their own. You have to be able to understand how polar coordinates just make locations on the plane before any of this stuff is going to really make sense. So if you're having difficulty with working through polar equations, but you don't have a really good understanding of polar coordinates yet, that's the thing. You really want to work on polar coordinates. So make sure you've watched the previous lesson before watching this one and that you're comfortable with polar coordinates before you try to work on polar equations and functions. If you can make sense of how polar coordinates work, polar equations and functions probably won't actually be that much harder. All right, let's get started. We can set up equations and functions using r and theta exactly the same way as we did for x and y. Generally, theta is going to be the independent variable, like x was, right? Our x was allowed to change and vary around, and then the y was, sorry, the r, well, r will be our dependent variable in the same way y was. So x was allowed to change around, and y responded to x's changes. Similarly here, it's going to be theta that will be allowed to change around, and our distance out r will respond to the angle that we're at. So here are some examples. We could have an equation r equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta. So we plug in a theta and it tells us an r. Or a function r of theta equals 3 times sine 2 theta, which is the same thing as we plug in a theta and it gives us what the r value will be. So while r could be the independent and theta the dependent, we could have r be independent and theta the dependent, such relationships are pretty uncommon in polar equations and functions. We normally think in terms of how does length change based on the angle. If we go to this angle, what length will be at, and not the opposite way. Just like when we're doing a rectangular graph, we normally think in terms of what hor for this horizontal location, what height will I be at? For this horizontal location, what height will I be at? And not for this height, what horizontal location will I be at? Right? We don't normally think height, then horizontal. We think horizontal, then height. Because x is the independent and y is the dependent. Just like here, theta is the independent and r is the dependent. We always always assume that theta is in radians. So whenever we're looking at our theta, it's assumed theta is going to be in radians. So that's numbers like pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, decimal things, etc. It could be explicitly put in degrees, but that would be extremely rare. Always, always, always use radians unless you're being told explicitly otherwise that this thing is in degrees. That is extremely uncommon. You almost never see something like that. I can't even think of one time I've seen it. So just don't expect that to happen. Expect to be using radians when you're working with polar equations and graphs. So always think in terms of radians. You're plugging in radian values and you're plotting with radian values on your angles. All right, how do we graph in polar coordinates? We graph polar equations and functions pretty much the same way that we graphed normal stuff. You plug in a sum value for your independent, in this case theta, you plot the point that gets spat out, and then you connect the whole thing with curves to make it into a graph. So theta is the independent variable, so we plug in some value for it, and then we see what distance r we get out. So here, let's plot some points. If we're looking at 1 plus 2 cosine theta, the equation r equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta, then r is going to come out once we plug in some theta. So if we plug in 0, well, 1 plus 2 cosine of 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so 2 times 1 is 2, so 1 plus 2 is 3. So we now have the point 0, comma, whoops. Not 0, 3, but 3, 0. That's one little confusing thing, is the fact that it's not x, y, it's now r, theta. So our independent variable is actually the thing that comes second. So don't let that confuse you. So our distance out of 3 and our theta is going to be an angle of 0. So we wind up getting this point right here. We have an angle of 0. We are 0 above the starting location. We haven't moved at all. And we are out on the third 
uh, circle out. So we are at 3 comma 0. Next up, pi over 4. If we plug in pi over 4, well, 1 plus 2 times cosine of pi over 4. Well, cosine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. 2 times root 2 over 2 is be root 2. So that means we get 1 plus root 2 out of this. 1 plus root 2, we figure that out with a calculator so we can actually plot something down. That's approximately 2.41. So at this point, we're at angle pi over 4. So we are on this arc sector line right here. As notice, it's broken into eight pieces, so each one of them is going to be pi over four, because up here is pi over two. So we are at the line of pi over four angle, and then we go out two pi four, two point four one. Sorry about that. Two point four one comma pi over four is the point that we get out of this. So we are two point four one out somewhere that looks around two point four, right? A little more than two, but even more less than three. So we get this point right here. Okay, same thing for plug in pi over 2. We plug in pi over 2, 1 plus 2 times cosine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So we just get 1. So we have the point 1 comma pi over 2. And that gets us this point here. So now we think about how are these things going to connect through curves, right? If we're really confused about it, we could just plot down more points, right? We could put down pi over 6 and pi over 3 as well. And if we want even more points, we could continue to plot down more and more points. But we'd probably be able to get a pretty good sense with just pi over 6 and pi over 3. But we can even just figure this out by thinking, well, how is it curving? What's happening? So as, we, as the angle goes up, notice that because it's cosine of theta, as this goes to larger and larger values, 0 to pi over 4 to pi over 2, cosine shrinks down and down. So this portion of our equation, the 2 cosine theta, will get smaller and smaller as cosine theta gets smaller and smaller. So as we get larger and larger, it shrinks down to ultimately this value of 1 right here. So we go up, and as it gets farther out, it shrinks down, it shrinks down, it cuts through here, it shrinks down, it shrinks down, and we get something like that, that curve. We can see it precisely here, now drawn by a computer. r equals 1 plus 2 cosine theta. At this point, we just keep plotting more points. Here's a new interesting one to think about. If we plot in 3 pi over 4, well, that's 1 plus 2 times cosine of 3 pi over 4. What does 3 pi over 4 come out to be? That's 1 plus 2 times negative root 2 over 2. So that gets us 1 minus root 2. We approximate that with a calculator, we get negative 0.41, which means that we've got the point negative 0.41 comma 3 pi over 4. So here is our 3 pi over 4. It's right here, right? This is the 3 pi over 4 location. So we're on this line, but we've got negative 0.41, so we are going in the opposite direction, and we are here for our point. We plug in pi. 2 times cosine of pi, what is pi? Cosine of pi is negative 1, right? So 2 times negative 1 gets us negative 2. 1 minus 2 gets us negative 1. So we've got the point negative 1 comma pi out of this. So at the angle of pi, right, here's angle pi, we are going to be going opposite a length of 1, and so we are here as well. So once again, it's continuing to drop down. This part here is continuing to get smaller and smaller until eventually it becomes negative. So it actually continues out in this curve here, and then it cuts through. It will always have to cut through the origin, because if it hits a 0 in the R, then it has to go through the origin, because distance 0 from the origin, distance 0 from the pole means at the pole, right? Cut through here, and then curve up to here. And that's what we've got so far. Computer, computer drawn there, so it's a little more accurate. But we basically just keep plotting points. If we plug in 5 pi over 4, we see that's at negative 0.41. So at 5 pi over 4, that'd be this angle here. So we're in the opposite now. We're over here. At 3 pi over 2, we have length 1. So at 3 pi over 2, we're here. So length 1 in that direction. 7 pi over 4, we're at length approximately 2.41. So 7 pi over 4. We're out 2.41 from here, and we continue this curving. We can also see at this point, perhaps, that, hey, it's going to wind up being symmetric. We, if we looked at the entire table of values, we'd see that there's some symmetry going on in the way these distances are coming out, and that we're going to wind up seeing the top part, sort of top part. This curve so far will happen and just sort of flip over, and we'll wind up getting it out like this. And finally, a computer drawn version that's better than my, you know, slight, slightly imperfect drawing. And that's what we wind up getting out of this. You plot points, you work it out, you graph the whole thing. 
So just like graphing with rectangular equations, you don't need to plot a huge number of points. It won't hurt. If you plot more points, it's not going to hurt. But you really only have to plot enough so that you can sketch the graph, right? So which points should you plot? What are the useful points to plot? What are the interesting points to plot? Many polar equations involve trigonometric functions. The interesting points are when the trig function produces a zero, so when we plug some theta into that trig function and it spits out zero, or when it spits out an extreme value. For sine and cosine, that's positive or negative one. Plugging in those values for our theta lets us see what are the most extreme values that our function is going to make, which helps us have an understanding of how the whole thing's behaving. More points will just make us smoother, easier to make the curves, but those are the most important ones of all, so you definitely want to make sure that you're plotting those. So if we want to try to plot these extreme values and these zeros, we want to figure out where will these interesting values occur? How are we going to get to it? So trig function, they tend to have a pattern. We're used to working with sine and cosine. So we want to think in terms of sine, we have to plug in 0 or pi over 2 or pi, right? If it's sine of theta, we have to plug in 0 or pi over 2 or pi or 3 pi over 2. Any of these would wind up getting an interesting number, right? Sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. Sine of pi, 0. Sine of 3 pi over 2, negative 1. We're used to working with that from all of our work in trigonometry. If we go to something else though, like cosine of 5 times theta, well it's not just theta in there anymore, it's 5 times that. So if it were cosine of something, we'd want that something to be 0, and then pi over 2, and then pi, and then 3 pi over 2, and then 2 pi, and so on. But in this case it's 5 times theta, so that has to be taken into account in how our something works. So the 0 is still, that's still going to just be the same, right? So if we plug in a 0, 5 times 0 still gets a 0. But if we want to try to figure out pi over 2 equals 5 theta, what does our theta have to go in to get that interesting first value of pi over 2? We divide both sides by 5 and we'd get pi over 10 equals theta. So pi over 10 equals theta, because if we plug in pi over 10, 5 times pi over 10 is pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 gets us 0. So that's our next interesting thing. Similarly, it's going to continue on this pattern of pi over 10 being the interval here, right? 5 over pi, uh, sorry, pi over 5, said that the wrong way, 5 times pi over 5 would get us pi, cosine of pi, negative 1, interesting value. Cosine of 5 times 3 pi over 10 would get us cosine of 3 pi over 2, 0 interesting value, right? So we're thinking in terms of what do we have to plug in here total to get 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, the sort of normal interesting values, but then we have to pay attention to the fact that it's not just theta, it's something interacting with theta, so we have to pay attention to what the numbers are going to be, and that helps us figure out what numbers we want to plot in when we're trying to graph. Finally, what if it was 2 theta plus 1? So in this case, theta equals 0 won't even show up because we have to figure out what would make this something, what would make 2 theta plus 1 turn into 0. Well, if we plug in negative 1 half for theta, 2 theta plus 1, we plug in negative 1 half, 2 times negative 1 half gets us negative 1, negative 1 plus 1 gets us 0. So if we plug in negative 1 half for our theta, we get out a 0 from it. What if we plug in theta equals pi over 4 minus 1 half? Well, then we've got 2 theta plus 1. So 2 times pi over 4 minus 1 half gets us pi over 2 minus 1 plus 1. So we get pi over 2 out of this. Let's work that one out. If we had 2 theta plus 1 equal to pi over 2, we'd have to work out how to get to this. So 2 theta equals pi over 2 minus 1 theta if we're trying to get to this value of pi over 2, if we want this whole something here to come out to be pi over 2, the theta will have to wind up being pi over 4 minus 1 half. And that's where we're getting it. Same thing if we want this whole something to be pi, we wind up needing pi over 2 minus 1 half. If we want the whole something to be 3 pi over 2, we need to plug in 3 pi over 4 minus 1 half for our angle theta. Notice that in each one of these, we're stepping up by pi over 4 each time. Over here, we were stepping up by pi over 5 each time. So once you start to notice the pattern, the pattern will normally continue. But it will depend on the specific circumstances of what is inside of your trigonometric function. Beyond looking for these interesting points, you might notice repetition in trig functions leading to symmetries in the graph. Depending on the way the trig functions are set up, you might notice, oh hey, all the same stuff's going to happen here, and because of the way my angle's going to work, oh, there's going to wind up being a symmetry occurring in the graph. If you notice a symmetry, if you see a symmetry will certainly occur, just use that to make graphing easier. You won't have to plot all those points because you'll see, oh, it's just going to wind up doing effectively the same thing, but reversed or flipped in some way. If at any time you're unsure how the graph will behave, just plot more points, right? That's the easiest way to be sure of what's going to happen of all. If you are uncertain about what will come next, 
calculate a bunch of points, just drop them in and connect the curve through those points. The more points you have down, the easier it will be to see how the curve works. After time, you'll develop a sensibility, you'll get an intuition for how these curves are going to come out, how they're going to look, so you won't have to plot as many points. But when you're just starting out, if you're uncertain about a graph, plot more points and you'll have a good idea of where to go. Occasionally you'll see an equation that only uses one variable, where there's just one variable there. And a lot of students freak out. There's no reason to freak out. It's totally fine to have one variable. It just means that variable that you said is fixed and the other one can change freely. For example, if we had r equals 2, then that means our distance is always 2. But theta, is theta show up in r equals 2? Theta doesn't show up at all. So theta can be anything over here. In our red one over here, theta can be anything. So if theta can be anything, then that means we set r equals 2, so it's going to always be on this length of 2, uh, this distance of 2 from the center, but our theta can wind up going to any spin at all, right? It can be anything. So as theta is allowed to spin positive or negative, it's going to always wind up being stuck on the circle, so we wind up drawing this perfect red circle at a distance of 2 from the origin. Similar thing going on over here with theta equals pi over 3. If theta equals pi over 3, we never mentioned r in there. We never mentioned the distance. So that means r can be anything. So since r can be anything, we have to be on the angle of pi over 3. But r could be any positive thing, so it could go out forever this way. And r could be any negative thing, so it can go out in the opposite direction. So with theta equals pi over 3, with theta at a fixed value, we wind up creating a line. With r at a fixed value, like r equals 2, we wind up creating a circle. Because we either with r, if we fix r, we've fixed a distance, but we're able to go to any angle, so we're making a circle. And if we fix an angle and we're allowed to go to any distance, we've drawn a line. And that's what's going on if we just fix a single variable. Converting coordinate types. Sometimes we'll want to convert an entire equation or function from polar to rectangular or vice versa. We can do so with the same conversion formulas we figured out and used in the previous lesson. So when we figured out these formulas, they were based off any x, y, r, and theta. We didn't say what x, y, r, and theta had to be. So this is going to work for converting the variables in equations. They can be used to convert from one variable type to the other variable, to convert from x, y to r, theta, or r, theta to x, y. So previously we had x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta for one set, and then the other set of formulas was r squared equals x squared plus y squared tan theta equals y over x. Pretty much any way that you can see these working out to allow you to swap variables around so you can get to the kind of variables you want, go ahead and use them. These are the formulas that will allow you to convert from one type of equation to another type of equation, to switch from polar to rectangular or rectangular to polar. And if you ever forget any of these formulas, if you forget, you can rederive them by drawing this picture right here. Because we know that r is always the hypotenuse, and we know that x and y are the horizontal and vertical, and we know theta has got to be the angle inside of the triangle, so we can figure out all of these equations x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, r squared equals x squared plus y squared, tan theta equals y over x, just through basic trig, because we know right down here it is a right triangle. So you can just use basic trig and rederive this. If in the middle of an important exam they all disappear from your head, you just draw a picture and you go, basic trigonometry, right? Not too hard. All right, polar equations allow us to make really interesting graphs. That is to say, wacky, bizarre, cool, strange graphs. Graphs that look nothing like the kind of graphs we're used to with rectangular, uh, rectangular equations. So they allow us to make really, really interesting stuff very easily. For example, look at this red one right here. Could you imagine figuring out any way to graph that with rectangular x and y to make an x and y equation that could make this flower looking thing? Like, that looks so unlike what we're used to graphing, but it only takes two times sine of six theta plus 0.5. We're able to say that incredible thing where it's got these large petals and these small petals and a bunch of them repeating in this kind of symmetrical pattern with very, very little work. Very, very little writing is required to be able to make this incredibly detailed picture. Same thing over here in the blue picture. We're able to get this weird sort of smushed thing that doesn't really look like anything specific, but it's a picture and it's not very hard to write out. Once again, 2 cosine theta minus sine of 5 times theta. And we're able to get this very strange looking picture that there'd be no easy way for us to create a graph with x and y coordinates that we'd be used to using here. But in polar graphs, it's pretty darn easy to do. We can make really interesting things, things that we're really not used to seeing before with not that much, um, not that long an equation. 
Polar equations and functions are really a new way of thinking about graphing. As such, it is a great time to use a graphing calculator. This is like the best time for graphing calculators. Plot random equations in there. Alter equations that you already understand and just get a sense for how polar stuff works by playing around with graphs on a graphing calculator. If you want more information, check out the appendix. There's an appendix to the course entirely on graphing calculators, how to use graphing calculators, what good graphing calculators are. And even if you don't own one and you're not going to buy one, absolutely for sure, there are free options out there. So there's lots of cool stuff where you can go like just on the web really quickly and in five minutes you can be graphing polar stuff. Heck, probably in one minute you can be graphing polar stuff. And you'd, you know, you'd be able to get that without having to spend any money on a graphing calculator. And just playing around, playing around for this stuff is going to help you understand polar graphs massively. Just, you know, trying different stuff, screwing around, putting in things, looking at how changing one number here changes the whole thing. Just being able to see that incredible speed of responsiveness of a graphing calculator, being able to change immediately when you do something. You don't have to take all the time to plot it carefully because that goes so slowly it's hard to realize what's going on. But if you just change one variable in a graphing calculator and it creates a new graph, you'll be able to gain this really beautiful intuition of how polar graphs work, how a polar equation creates the graph associated with it. So I really, really strongly recommend if you've got a graphing calculator and even if you don't have a graphing calculator, check out the appendix. I'll talk about lots of places where you can get free ones where you can just go play with them right now immediately and you'll be able to get a really good understanding of how polar graphs work with not that much effort. Just playing around for 10, 15 minutes will give you such a better understanding of polar graphs if you find them difficult, even in the slightest. Also, I want to point out one really important thing. When you're using a graphing calculator, pay attention to the interval that theta has. Normally, they're going to start off your theta being from 0 to 2 pi, and that's going to often be enough to give you the entire graph, but it won't always. It might not show you everything. So if it doesn't show you everything you need to see, if there's some part missing, you might want to expand it. And you might not even realize there's something missing. So you might want to just try increasing your interval to like negative 6 pi to positive 6 pi or negative 10 to positive 10 and just see if that changes the graph. If it doesn't change the graph, then you know a 0 to 2 pi interval is enough. But if it does change the graph, that tells you you need to think about how big does your interval need to be to be able to see the whole graph. And maybe it won't even be possible to graph the entire interval all at once on one graph like we're going to see in example. Two. All right, we're ready for some examples. First, let's graph the function r of theta equals 3 times sine of 2 theta. So we plug in thetas here, it gives some value here, and that tells us what our r is going to be. So it's just a plug in a number, get, a, get something out of it, and that tells us our r. We plug in some value for theta, we get r. So let's figure out some values for this. Let's figure out how often do we need to do this. Well, we've got 2 theta as our thing in here. So 2 theta, if we were solving for the very first interesting point, which would normally occur at pi over 2, right? Zero Zero is an interesting point, but we can be certain zero is already going to show up and that one doesn't tell us as much, then that's going to be theta equals pi over 4. So we're going to have interesting points occur at an interval of every pi over 4 that we go out. So let's plug in pi over 4s to figure this out. So we'll plug in thetas. We're going to make a whole bunch of them. And here's our r's. And let's plug in, if we plug in 0, so 3 times sine of 0, sine of 0 is 0, so we're just going to get 0 in here. If we plug in pi over 4, we figured out our first interesting point was pi over 4. 3 times sine of 2 times pi over 4, 2 times pi over 4 is pi over 2. Sine of pi over 2 is 1, 3 times 1 is 3, so we get positive 3 over here for our r. At this point, we can draw a graph so we can start plotting some things. So we know that we're going to have to at least get out to a distance of 3, and I'll tell you it actually is only going to go out to a total distance of 3 at the maximum, so we'll have circles every 3. So here is our first distance circle. Pardon me if my circles aren't absolutely perfect, I am but a human. Second distance circle. And our third distance circle. Okay, and then let's see, since we know we're going to be based off of pi over 4, let's cut angles at pi over 4 as well. Cool. So now we can plot some points. At 0, at an angle of 0, we go out 0. So our first point is just at the pole on that o origin, what we used to call the origin. At an angle of pi over 4, so this one right here, we're a distance of 3, 1, 2, 3 distance out. 
Next up, let's try pi over 2, the next pi over 4 forwards, the next interesting point. We plug in sine of 2 times pi over 2, 2 times pi over 2, pi. So sine of pi is 0, so we wind up getting 3 times 0, 0. So by the time we get back to pi over 2, this angle here, we're back down to 0. So what's that look like, right? As pi over 4 goes to pi over 2, it, gets, it goes down, right? From 0 up to pi over 2, we increase to 3, and then we decrease back down to 0, right? We increase... We increase to 3, and then we decrease down to 0. From 0 to pi over 2, we go up to 3 and then down to 0. So as we spin counterclockwise, our thing increases, increases. We touch that, and we spin back down. We get smaller and smaller, back down to 0. So that's the first part of our graph. Let's see what else is going to happen here. If we plug in 3 pi over 4, if we plug in 3 pi over 4, sine times 2, sine of 2 times 3 pi over 4, 2 times 3 pi over 4 is 3 pi over 2. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. 3 times negative 1, negative 3. So at an angle of 3 pi over 4, which is here, we're negative 3, so we're going to go in the opposite direction, right? We're going to go opposite. We were going this way, but we're now going to go opposite because it's negative 3, so we're at 1, 2, 3 here. And then at pi, the next interesting place, sine of 2 pi is 0, 2 times pi, 2 pi. So sine of 2 pi is 0, so we get 0 once again here. And so it's going to do the same thing where as it goes from pi over 2 to pi, it becomes, so here's 0, here's pi over 2, here's pi. So for the first part, it went up to 3, and then it went back down to 0 when it got to pi over 2. And now it's going to go down to negative 3, and then it's going to go up to positive, uh, to, not positive, to 0. So we're seeing it go up and then down, and then negative, and then back to zero. So for this part, it's going more and more negative, so we wind up seeing it curve out like this as it gets to larger and larger angles, and we see it spin this way. Okay. Next up, we have 5 pi over 4. At 5 pi over 4, we plug that in 2 times 5 pi over 4. 2 times 5 pi over 4 is going to be um, 10 pi over 4, which is the same thing as 2 pi plus well, let's just write this out because that way it's a little less confusing. 5 pi over 4 times 2. So 2 times 5 pi over 4 is equal to 10 pi over 4. And hey, look, that's the same thing as 8 pi over 4. Oops, that should be an equal sign. 8 pi over 4 plus 2 pi over 4. So that's the same thing as 2 pi plus pi over 2. Hey, everything that we've got here is just going to wind up being the same thing as this. The pi over 4 here will match up to the 5 pi over 4 here. So we're going to wind up getting 3. And this idea in mind, we could actually realize really quickly, pi over 2 here is going to match to whoops, 6 pi over 4, which is 3 pi over 2. So as we go that extra pi forward, because we've got this 2 here, it's going to wind up repeating everything as well. Our angles will be new and different and interesting, but the r's will wind up repeating. We're going to see a repeat of this part here is just going to repeat here. So 3 pi over 2 gets us 0. 7 pi over 4 will get us negative 3. And 2 pi, we will be right back where we started, 0. So it will wind up getting back to where we started. So let's plot 5 pi over 4. At an angle of 5 pi over 4, we're at this part. We go out a distance of 3. So we're here. So we just got back to the origin when we were at pi. Same thing. It curves out, grows larger when it gets out to it. And then it gets smaller and smaller at this point. It drops back down. We're starting to see some symmetry. It's like there's petals here. Petals is a way of talking about this. 7 pi over 4. At 7 pi over 4, we're here. But once again, it is negative 3. So we go the opposite direction. So we go out to here. And there we go. They should be perfectly symmetrical. If the graph was absolutely perfect, it was drawn by a computer, they'd wind up being perfectly symmetrical petals. But we can see, get a pretty good sense of what's going on even drawing it by hand. Second example, graph the equation r equals 1.5 raised to the theta over 2, where theta is between negative 2 pi and 2 pi. So it goes from negative 2 pi to 2 pi. So at this one, let's start off, we'll graph well, we have really no idea of what this is going to wind up being. So we've got 1.5 r equals 1.5 raised to the theta over 2. So we're dividing our theta by 2. So we know that we're going to want 0 in there because it's smack dab in between negative 2 pi and positive 2 pi. And we'll want to go all the way down to negative 2 pi and all the way up to 2 pi. So let's do this by pi over 2. Pi over 2s will be easy to graph as well since they're the cross axis that we normally have in there. So a distance of r. So if we plug in theta at 0 first, well, 1.5 raised to the 0, that one's easy. We always wind up getting 
1, right? Raise any number to the 0, you wind up getting 1 out of it. Next up, though, a little bit more difficult. If we plug in pi over 2, then what do we get out of this? Well, we'll have to use a calculator. So here's how we do the first one. If we were to try to figure out 1. Uh, 1.5 raised to the pi over 2 over 2. So we've got pi over 2 over 2. Well, that's going to be the same thing as 1.5 to the pi over 4. So we might not be able to figure this out by hand, but we could put this into a calculator, right? 3.14. 1.57 would be half of that. So it's going to be, well, it's just going to be plugging in those numbers and getting an approximate value. So this comes out to be approximately, using a calculator, we get 1.37 out of it. Sorry, I meant to say 1.57 because 3.14 over 2 would be equal to 1.57, but then this is 1.57 over 4. 3.14 over 4, so that's 1.57 over 2. Point is we could work it out with a calculator and get an approximate decimal value for what that winds up being. That comes out to be 1.37. We do the same thing for each one of these. We plug in pi, so it's 1.5 to the pi over 2, or 1.5 to the approximately 1.57. We raise that. Our calculator gives us that that's approximately 1.89. 3 pi over 2. Our calculator gives us that that gives us approximately 2.60, 2 pi, and we get approximately 3.57. What if we went the other way? Negative pi over 2, raising that up there, 1.5 to the negative pi over 2 divided by 2, so 1.5 to the negative pi over 4, we get approximately 0 0.72. Negative pi, raising it to the negative pi over 2, we get 0 0.53. Raising it to the negative 3 pi over 2 over 2 gets us 0 0.38. And finally, at negative 2 pi, we get 0 0.28. So notice, at 0, if we take 0 and we go up with 0, if we go up, the value gets larger and larger, right? We've got it getting larger and larger, fast, faster and faster, because remember, this is an exponential function. So it'll get faster and faster growing as we go to larger and larger values of theta. <coughs> As we go to negative values of theta, though, it gets smaller and smaller because it's an exponential function. Once again, we're seeing the tail part get close, really down close to that x-axis. So we can draw this out. We have our extreme value. The most extreme value we get out to is 3.57. So we'll set our most extreme circle at a distance of 4. These just single crossbars will be enough because we're only concerned at pi over 2 is the only real reference angle we have going on here, so that'll be okay. So here is a distance of one circle. Here is a distance of two circle. Here is a distance of three circle. Here is a distance of four circle. Whoops, that got a little bit out of my hand. Here is a distance of four circle. That's better. Okay. So that's a pretty reasonable setup for our axes. Um, at this point, we can plot some points. So at zero, at an angle of zero, we are one out. So here's our first point. At an angle of pi, we are at one point, sorry, at an angle of pi over two, so going straight up, we are at 1.37, so almost to halfway out. At pi, this angle here, we're at 1.89, so getting pretty close to that distance of 2. At 3 pi over 2, we're at 2.60, so a little bit over halfway between the 2 and the 3 ring. At 2 pi, we're at 3.57, so a little bit between halfway between the 3 and the 4 ring. So we've got this as we go to a larger and larger angle, the distance out increases. We see it spiraling out the farther out it gets, right? And it continues to spiral out this way. So this is what we see as it, the angle gets larger and larger as it spirals out. What if the larger, what if the angle goes negative? Well, at negative pi over 2, remember, this is negative pi over 2 because it's talking about going clockwise instead. So at negative pi over 2, we have 0 0.72. So 0 0.72 around here. At negative pi, that's here because remember, clockwise now. So we're at 0 0.53. At negative 3 pi over 2, that's this one here, we're at 0 0.38. At negative 2 pi, we're at 0 0.28. So we wind up seeing it continue the spiral in and in and in and in and in. 
So negative 2 pi to 2 pi, that's what's stopping this from continuing out forever. If this was allowed to keep going forever, we'd see it spiral off way out forever. If this was allowed to continue forever, we'd see it spiral into the center more and more and more and more. So that negative 2 pi to 2 pi, that's why we have to have an interval set, is because sometimes if we don't set an interval, we could just keep going forever. Right? And that's why we have it set in our graphing calculator. If you're using a graphing calculator, you have to pay attention to the interval because sometimes it will wind up cutting off parts of the graph that you want to see. Right? You wouldn't see that part where it gets to continue to spin in if you didn't have a larger than 0 as the bottom of your interval. You have to go to negative 2 pi, negative 4 pi, negative 10 pi to really get a sense of just how much that spirals into the center. All right, third example, convert the equation from polar to rectangular, then solve for y in terms of x. So what were all of our equations? We have x equals r cosine theta is one of our formulas for changing. y equals r sine theta is another formula. r squared equals x squared plus y squared is another. And tan theta equals y over x. So in this case, we see right off the bat, 6r squared times cosine squared theta. We're not quite sure about that part, but hey, here's r sine theta. Here's r sine theta. So we can swap them out. That's 3y equals 7. What about this part here, right? What about r squared cosine squared theta? Well, we realize that sounds an awful lot like r cosine theta. So how can we get r cosine theta to show up there? We maybe think, oh, well, there's r squared. There's cosine squared. We can pull that squared out, and we could write this as 6r cosine theta and then that whole thing squared. And then minus 3y equals 7. So at this point, we can swap out x equals r cosine theta. So we've got 6 times x squared minus 3y equals 7. Add 3y, subtract 7 on both sides. So we've got 6x squared minus 7 equals 3y. We can divide by 3 on both sides. So we could write this as y equals 6x squared minus 7 and that divide by 3. So we've managed to convert this to rectangular x and y, and it's now in the form y equals stuff involving x. What if we're doing the reverse? We're going from polar to, sorry, we're going from rectangular to polar. So last time we went from polar to rectangular, so now we're going the other way. So solve for r in terms of theta. Once again, we've got the same x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, r squared equals x squared plus y squared, and tan theta equals y over x. So in this case, we see, oh, hey, that's nice. We've got r cosine theta, r sine theta. We've got y. We've got x. So we can just swap those out directly, right? We can swap them out for what we have here. So we swap them out. y is r sine theta equals 2 times x is r cosine theta. So 2 times r cosine theta plus 3. So at this point, we were told to solve for r in terms of theta. So we need to get our r's on one side so we can get just r by itself. So we move the 2r cosine theta over by subtracting it. So we've got r sine theta, now minus 2r cosine theta from both sides, equals positive 3 is still left over here. Now notice we've got an r here and an r here. So we can use the distributive, the distributive property in reverse. We pull that r out, and we've got sine theta minus 2 cosine theta equals 3. We now divide that out. So we have just r. So r equals 3 over sine theta minus 2 cosine theta. That might be a little surprising. That seems like a fairly complicated thing if it's going to just give us a line, right? But some, th some things, polar is better at graphing certain kinds of pictures, and rectangular is graphing other kinds of pictures. So it depends on the thing. Rectangular is great for graphing lines. Polar is not as great at graphing lines. And you might be surprised that that would even wind up coming out to be a line. Try plugging it into a graphing calculator, and you'll see that winds up giving us y equals 2x plus 3. It's just another way of graphing it. You might have a little bit of difficulty seeing why that winds up giving it. If you think about it, this bottom part here is going to sort of work as an asymptote as it approaches the same angle that this line is based on, which is why it's going to shoot off infinitely in both the top and the bottom. So think about that for a while. Try graphing it. Just in general, try to play around with graphing as many polar functions as you can. It will really give you such a great sense of how the stuff is working if you just play with it for a while on a graphing calculator. All right. We'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.